All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. My name uh, is Shai DeLuca, and thank you for joining us for this important nationwide event. Uh, it is my honor to host this presentation this evening, and I would like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of the land that we are on today. While we meet on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land which we each call home. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of the Inuit, Métis, and First Nation people of this land that call home. We have gathered today to release Be an Upstander, How Allies Can Recognize and Counter Anti-Semitism, which is such an, important, uh, such an important cause, certainly for today. And this initiative is in partnership between Upstanders Canada, a new national movement to mobilize primarily, but not only, non-Jewish Canadians to stand up against anti-Semitism, and Kolot Main Reform Temple in Victoria, British Columbia. We are also very grateful for funding from the Union for Reform Judaism, the Anti-Defamation League, and the Jewish Federation of Victoria and Vancouver Island. If you are here, you probably have some understanding of the crisis uh, here in Canada and many other societies face right now around the world with regards to anti-Semitism. We hope that this hour provides you with a deeper understanding about how anti-Semitism can look, and the toolkit that we are introducing today will equip you with practical ways to address the problem. I've read it. It is phenomenal. All people of goodwill recognize and condemn overt anti-Semitism. Fire bombings, shootings, and other violent and frightening incidents we have seen far too often in Canada recently. This toolkit is intended to help us understand the more subtle ways and biases and stereotypes that Jews uh, face and how we can influence uh, others and individuals as a society using these tools provided by this phenomenal toolkit. Importantly, this toolkit is aimed especially at non-Jewish Canadians. Contesting anti-Semitism should not, should not be the work of Jewish people. That is the core premise of Upstanders Canada. In the next hour, guys, we will hear from several speakers and give you an introductory overview of this new toolkit. This will be followed by questions and answers. And I'm asking that you please submit all your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we will do our very best to get to as many questions as possible. I am honored at this time to present greetings from Deborah Lyons, Canada's Special Envoy to Holocaust Remembrance and Combating Anti-Semitism. Special Envoy Lyons is a Canadian diplomat who has served many, among many other roles, as Canada's ambassador to Israel, and before that, as ambassador to the Islamic uh, Republic of Afghanistan. In October 2023, she was appointed by the Prime Minister as Special Envoy, uh, replacing Erwin Kotler, and she has forwarded this greeting to us to share with you all today. Hello everyone. I'm Deborah Lyons, the Canadian Special Envoy for Combating Anti-Semitism and Holocaust Remembrance. It's a true honor to speak to the group of you today, even if it's only virtually, because you are a group of people united in a common purpose to fight against the unprecedented <coughs> and insidious rise of anti-Semitism in our beloved Canada. So first and foremost, I want to extend my congratulations to Upstanders Canada for your launch today. Your unwavering commitment to combat anti-Semitism is exactly what we need right now. You have chosen to stand up, to speak out, and take action, not because you are directly affected, but even more importantly, because you believe in a just and inclusive society. Today, I am especially excited to acknowledge your new toolkit on anti-Semitism. This comprehensive guide is a treatment and a testament for education and empowerment by providing historical context, practical steps, and valuable resources, this toolkit will equip Canadians 
to recognize and to combat anti-Jewish hate. I also want to say that it will be an excellent companion to our upcoming handbook, which will help to educate Canadians on the practical uses of the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. So Upstanders Canada, your work is a powerful reminder for all of us that fighting hate is not the sole responsibility of those whom it targets. It is a collective duty, a Canadian duty, our full commitment to ensure that every member of our society feels safe, feels valued, and feels respected. And as we all know, this is only possible if we are supporting and protecting one another. So thank you for your allyship, for your courage, and your relentless pursuit for a just and a fair and better Canada. Thank you so much. I look forward to continuing to work with you. Sorry about that. Thanks so much to Special Envoy Deborah Lyons for this message of encouragement. Many Canadians do not know that incidents of anti-Semitic hate crimes have skyrocketed in the past several years. Since October 7th of last year, all evidence is the situation has become significantly worse. In Toronto alone, where I live, since October 7th, anti-Jewish hate crimes have increased 93% since the same period a year earlier. Across Canada, we have seen shootings at Jewish schools, an arson attack on a synagogue in Vancouver, attacks on Jewish-owned businesses, and hundreds of lesser crimes. We need to make this clear and make it extremely clear. Anti-Semitism in Canada is not a consequence of overseas events. Anti-Semitism is a homegrown problem. A conflict in the Middle East is a spark that ignites existing prejudices. It is not the cause. Other conflicts around the world do not create this level of conflict in Canada. So why does this one? We need to confront the problem. That's why we are here today. Lynn Greenoff is rabbi with Kolot Maim Reform Temple in Victoria. Rabbi Lynn has grown up in Victoria and worked for years in the nonprofit sector and also for Canada Post as a truck driver for over 20 years. She is very involved with her community, Hevra Kadisha, the Jewish Burial Society, and helped organize the first international Hevra Kadisha conference in 2002. She is proudly Zionist and proud to serve her community. Thank you, Rabbi Lynn, for joining us. Please let's hear. Thank you. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being with us today. Uh, I don't know where our numbers are at, but we knew coming in that over 365 people were registered. So that's one of you for each day of the coming year. So that, I think that's a, a very good omen uh, for the work that we have ahead of us. And we all have work ahead of us. These last nearly nine months since October 7th, that infamous day, seems to have brought an ancient hatred above ground. What was once an underground seam perhaps has come above ground to the full light of day. And now we're seeing and hearing that too many people in Canada feel perfectly entitled to freely speak with disdain, with scorn, with dismissal of Jews, of Israel, of Zionism. The title that many of us read a number of years ago, None is Too Many, seems to be the meme of the day. We can cite ancient religious seeds of what devolved into racial hatreds. 
We can sort through various more contemporary DEI campaigns that want us to fit people into categories like racialized Matroska dolls, each subsumed by the next, until seemingly only the most oppressed, the most victimized are left standing. We can discuss perhaps how increasing numbers of secularization, people living without any kind of faith or community to connect to, are leaving too many of our young people absent of any moral or ethical compass, leaving them increasingly gullible, far too easily susceptible to emotionally sympathizing with these said victims. We know there are doctrinaire attitudes and politics being taught at our universities, increasingly at our high schools, and our students are too often falling for their marching orders, calling themselves comrades. Too many university students and others have built encampments, fortresses really of anti-Semitism, destroying property, and from there encouraging an exponentially increasing harassment of Jewish people, homes, schools, and businesses. Synagogues and Jewish schools are being fired upon, and churches are burning. In Canada, over 33 churches have gone up in flames since 2021. People are now turning to each other and saying, what is happening? How did we get here? And most importantly, what can I do? As a rabbi here today with all of you, I know I'm preaching to the converted. I know you're here because you want to learn some tools about how you can best respond to this exponential increase in words and acts of anti-Semitism. Jew hatred and disrespect for virtually all authority in Canada, be it government, police, or religious organizations, is increasing and we need to address this in its most genteel of forms at luncheons and in its most abject of forms. We need to be able to identify and speak to this degree of hatred that's growing in our very midst, in the midst of our midst, as I like to say. But today is not just an opportunity for us to share worry and fear for ourselves and for our neighbors or for our very country. It's an opportunity for us to learn how to work individually and together. Oh, I just you've just lost my video. Let's see what's happened here, sorry. My video, there we are, sorry about that. It's an opportunity for us to learn how to work as I said, individually and together, to learn how to make those calls, write those letters, attend meetings, and speak up. Today will be an opportunity for us to begin to build the trust that we each have the capacity to move resolve and fear into hope and action. And please know, it isn't just Jews you're here to protect. Quite often we paraphrase the idea that Jews are the proverbial canary in the coal mine. We cite Martin Niemöller, which ends, then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak out for me. The fact is, Regressive Marxist-based violence will take down democracies and substitute what can be described as the chaos, really, of democracy for a more hardcore demagoguery. When we hear the language of many of the students today, we hear the rhetoric of the Red Guards, we hear Stalin, we envision countries where individual rights have been utterly subsumed. And so we need to be brave. We need to find the courage within ourselves, courage for which we were born. We need to find our own heroes who will light a pathway of courage for each of us. My dad was my hero. 
During World War II, he enlisted in the Seaforth Highlanders in Vancouver at 17, moving from Galliano Island to Vancouver. He was wounded twice, in Sicily and in Italy. Dad was a hardworking man who at 90 could still remember his poker hand from 70 years earlier, sitting on a ship deck as his unit headed to Sicily. My father taught me that I had a particular responsibility in life to stand up for my beliefs, even if that meant I would stand alone. And so I offer you my father's words and encourage each of us to be like my dad. Stand up for what is right. Risk being alone. Be an upstander. And thank you again for being here with us today. Because in fact, when we act together, we are never alone. Thank you very much. Oh, there we go. But I can't, un I can't start my own video. For some reason, it's telling me that the host has to disable my, my video. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi Lynn, honestly, for those words. I mean, uh, sitting and listening to those words of encouragement for me as a Jew uh, mean more to me than I can possibly put into words now. And I just want to say personally, thank you to you. Uh, as many of you know, Canadian campuses are a front line in the rhetorical conflict um, over the conflict and a place where Jewish students have reported feeling excluded and even threatened. Jewish students are not alone on, can on Canadian campuses, though, and I am so pleased and honored to welcome Zara Naibo. Zara is a third year student at the University of British Columbia, majoring in cultural anthropology and minoring in the Jewish Studies program. Zara is a non-Jewish ally and just completed a media fo uh, fellowship with Allied Voices for Israel and Honest Reporting Canada, though through which an op-ed she wrote and published in the National Post, which I read and was phenomenal. She is a Stand With Us Emerson Fellow and will be engaged in anti-Semitism anti training over the next year. Zara, please take it away. Thank you so much, Shai. That was such a nice introduction. And thank you all for joining us here today. I'm so honored to be here today to share my perspective as a non-Jewish ally who has had a close-up view of the situation on one of Canada's largest university campuses during this past very, very challenging year. Quite recently, I was not much different than most of the students who set up tents at UBC. I did not know much about Jewish people, events in the Middle East, or their historical context. The echo chamber I was in, yes, we all have one, probably reflected the same themes and biases that have become so prevalent in recent months, especially on campuses and in the encampments. Meeting and getting to know Jewish people Hearing their stories, their experiences, and those of their families made me realize I did not know the full story. It was simply by being open and listening to perspectives I hadn't heard before from my now partner who is Jewish and his family and friends that made me question the assumptions I had previously held. Dr. Brene Brown has said, people are hard to hate up close. And I agree with that statement. One of the problems we have in confronting anti-Semitism is that Jewish people make up 1% of Canadian population, and almost all of those people live in one or two or three cities in Canada. When we choose to fight racism or other forms of bias, we are advised to listen to your friends who are people of color or members of the LGBTQ plus community, or the women in your life, or the members of whatever group we are striving to ally with. However, many Canadians may not know Jewish people or have a close Jewish friend, which presents an extra challenge. 
I have been very fortunate though. Through my partner, I became conscious of the Jewish experience and of anti-Semitism, including some of the subtle, unconscious ways anti-Semitism works, forms that are addressed in the toolkit being released today. On my own, I began to read and educate myself. I unlearned biases I had previously held. I learned about the Jewish people and I learned about the special theological, familial, cultural, historical, emotional, and countless other ties Jews worldwide have with Israel. In getting to know my partner's Israeli family, I learned of the sacrifices every family makes and the challenges that the country and its people have endured. I know Pat is going to talk about the challenging intersection of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism in his presentation, but I'd like to tell you about the extreme, extreme anti-Israel rhetoric we are seeing on campus. This rhetoric is not going to change the reality in the Middle East, but it is making life for Jewish students in Canada extremely difficult and in many cases, dangerous. Is that anti-Semitism? In a sense, what difference does it make what we call it? Jewish students are facing a hostile environment on campus. And in the process of checking our biases and unlearning racism, we are supposed to have learned that impact matters more than intent. Jewish students are feeling especially vulnerable on campuses. Yet when they express <laughs> their concerns, they are met not only with dismissal, but often contempt from both students and faculty alike, as though hostility is the least they should expect for believing that their people have a right to national self-determination. I have become an activist out of necessity due to the lack of non-Jewish students spe speaking up right now. I'm immersed in what's happening on campus and I can tell you firsthand that there is fear, there is anger, there is sadness, and there is tiredness. Jewish students in Canada are being harassed, verbally and physically assaulted, and prevented from fully partaking in student life and from being their true selves on campus. We are seeing bullying and targeting by fellow students, elected student representatives, professors, and in many cases across Canada, even by institutional leadership. I have witnessed Hillel BC become the only space on campus where Jewish students truly feel safe being Jewish. I've seen fear, anguish, panic attacks, and tears. I'm also seeing bewilderment among my Jewish friends surrounding why there are so few non-Jewish students standing together with them since October 7th. As an outsider to the Jewish community, I believe this is the time when allies of the Jewish community must stand up and speak out against anti-Semitism. I hear people say we need to stand against the rise in anti-Semitism, but I disagree with that wording because I think we should feel uncomfortable with any amount of anti-Semitism. The status quo anti-Semitism is not acceptable. And we need a broad movement of non-Jewish allies standing up and speaking out, standing with Jewish Canadians, whether we know any Jews or not. Recently, I was part of a conversation among Jewish students and non-Jewish students. The question was who among the non-Jewish students would risk our lives and our families to hide our Jewish friends if that ever became necessary again. My friends' grandparents' generations thought they were safe. They never imagined they would be forced to hide in forests or attics. They never dreamed a civilized society could turn as quickly as it did. And all of this happened in the current living generation's memory. For Jewish people, these are not history lessons. These are family stories. And these are things young Jews very rightly take to heart. I want to share one more thing from campus. My reading of history gave me an appreciation of the resiliency of the Jewish people. This year, I have seen that resiliency 
up close and in person. Jewish students on, Canada, on Canadian campuses didn't pick this fight. And yet I have seen friends who never saw themselves as activists be forced to take on a very public and very courageous role, which they have done so with no hesitation, fighting for their community. I have seen Jewish students respond to hostility and threats, not by retrenching, but by redoubling down their determination to stand against bullying, hatred, and intolerance. I definitely don't want to leave you with the idea that Jewish, student, that Jewish students are cowering in Hillel. They are most definitely not. On the contrary, I have seen bravery, courage, and inspiring toughness. But I want to get this across to you. They would feel a lot braver, a lot more courageous, and a lot tougher if more Canadians were standing with them. I speak to you right now as a living evidence that empathy and education can change minds. If people are willing to approach the toolkit being launched today with open minds and open hearts, I believe it will be a small step toward a world where people choose to be upstanders, not bystanders. I hope that you share this resource with your circles. I hope that you will read it with openness. I know I am still covering some of my own inherent biases, and this toolkit is an incredibly informative resource to learn from. Thank you for listening to me today, and most of all, thank you for being here. I hope you will join me in standing up and standing with Jewish Canadians in this moment of challenge and forever after. Thank you. I'm, I'm usually never speechless, but Zara, that was absolutely amazing. Thank you so, so much for those words. I am moved, you moved me to tears, honestly. And uh, I, I just wanna say thank you again for being, like you say, an upstander and not a bystander. Just very quickly, guys, I wanna just give some housekeeping tips here. There's no need to raise your hand for questions. Q&A is gonna be at the end. So send all of your questions to the Q&A function and we will get to them at the end. Uh, and also we are recording this webinar. So everybody who is participating in the webinar will have the opportunity uh, to have this uh, sent to them and they'll be able to rewatch it back um, after as well. So again, I wanted to say thank you again, Zara, because I, I, there are no words that will be able to really put into words how grateful I am for the uh, deeds that you, uh, that you are doing. I am now so happy to introduce a man that I call a dear friend, Pat Johnson, founder, director of Upstanders Canada, who will provide an overview of the toolkit on how to be an upstander. Pat is a journalist, an activist, and a communicator for nonprofits, social enterprises, and cause campaigns. He has a long history of engagement with the Jewish community in British Columbia and founded Upstanders as a nonpartisan, non denominational Big Tent movement for Canadians of all faiths, no faith, every race, orientation, and identity to stand up against anti Semitism. Take it away, Pat. Thank you. Thank you, Shai, for your introduction, and thank you um, especially for hosting this event. Your voice is an inspiration for all who believe in a Canada that is inclusive and welcoming to all. Thank you also to uh, Special Envoy Deborah Lyons, to Rabbi Lynn Greenoff, and Zara Naibo for your moving and meaningful words. That was in, all incredibly powerful uh, messages. A quick thanks also to a few folks behind the scenes today, Sam Margolis, who is managing the tech side with support from Jill Schneiderman and uh, Jonathan Lerner. I want to express my special gratitude to Marilyn Wolovic, without whose support and attention to detail, this event and this toolkit would never have been possible. Marilyn has been the lead person on this project from Kolat Maim and an irreplaceable help in making this happen. Thank you so much, Marilyn. Thanks also to the Union for Reform Judaism, the Anti-Defamation League, and the Jewish Federation of Victoria and Vancouver Island for financial and moral support. 
Last, but with special appreciation, I want to thank every individual who has joined us today. This is a moment of inflection in our collective history, a moment many of us thought and hoped would never come. Jewish people in Canada and around the world are experiencing a level of uncertainty and facing threats unknown in generations. We are thankful for every individual who is standing with the Jewish people and against anti-Semitism in this time. We cannot, though, pretend we are satisfied with the collective response we are seeing. At a time when our Jewish friends are very explicitly and vulnerably sharing their experiences, far, far too many Canadians have not responded as we would hope. The toolkit we are releasing today, Be an Upstander, How Allies Can Recognize and Counter Antisemitism, specifically addresses why this might be the case it also includes specific, tangible steps that each of us can take to broaden the circle and invite more of our friends, family, and neighbors to join this movement. One of the first things we must accept if we are going to confront anti-Semitism in Canada is that this problem is a Canadian problem. As Shai said, we cannot pretend that this is a result of foreign conflicts. This is a Canadian problem and it needs a Canadian solution. I'm going to give you a very brief overview of our new toolkit. I hope that it will inspire you to download it after this presentation and spend time with it. It will be available on the Upstanders website within minutes after the, um, after the presentation ends today. Give us maybe uh, 15, half an hour. Uh, there is a great deal of information in this resource, so I can only touch on a few points in this presentation. But one overriding theme in the toolkit is this. Anti-Semitism may not look like what you think it looks like. This toolkit focuses on inherent biases, stereotypes, tropes, and prejudices about Jews that many of us do not even know we carry. Overt anti-Semitic hatred and violence is real and dangerous. We've seen arson attacks, shootings, and so many other incidents. All people of goodwill condemn these as we must. But the sorts of inherent biases many or most of us carry to one degree or another may be more hazardous in the long term because they can affect our approaches to Jewish people and the world without us knowing it. They can seep into our society and our body politic. There is a content warning on this toolkit because we believe it is necessary for Canadians to understand the forms these prejudices can take, and it's not pretty. However, this is a hopeful, optimistic document because we are convinced that the self-reflection this will evoke in readers will inspire people to act, and action is always the antidote to hopelessness and helplessness. Be an Upstander is comprised of three main sections. There are also buttons to go deeper with which hyperlink to additional resources. The first section discusses the characteristics of anti-Semitism, the way anti-Semitism works. Othering is typical of almost all forms of discrimination but several characteristics of anti-Semitism are rare or unknown in other forms of racism. Central to anti-Semitism is victim blaming, which we see today in the reframing of anti-Jewish hate crimes as something Jewish people bring on themselves. Anti-Semitism also functions through an inversion of victim and perpetrator. There is projection, projection of our inner fears, hatreds, and uncertainties onto that most long-standing of scapegoats. There are conspiracy theories and dog whistles. There is envy and the bizarre phenomenon sometimes called punching up. This section helps us understand the architecture of anti-Semitism. The second section of the toolkit tangibly addresses what anti-Semitism looks like. These are a sampling of the vast range of forms anti-Semitism has taken historically and today. 
many of these, including dehumanization, demonization, assumptions of untrustworthiness and disloyalty, and the idea that Jews do not experience discrimination, but rather suffer from a persecution complex. These are all longstanding tropes of anti-Semitism that we are seeing alive and active today. Probably the most crucial characteristic of anti-Semitism, though, is the trope of Jewish power. Arguably, all other aspects of anti-Semitism hang to one extent or another on this fundamental and racist idea. In today's race dialogue, discrimination is premised on the presence or absence of power and privilege. Since anti-Semitism explicitly depicts Jews as powerful and privileged, it is the perfect prejudice. The very characteristics of anti-Semitism prove its legitimacy in the eyes, or importantly and far more likely, in the subconscious of the perpetrator. This is not easy reading, but we believe people need to see these examples so we can recognize the forms that these ideas can take, because if we do not recognize them, we cannot combat them. We can't ignore the elephant in the room. The intersection of anti-Semitism and attitudes toward Israel are where this conversation very often derails. We are not going to resolve this problem in an hour, but we do have three important considerations and two comparatively simple steps to move this discussion in the right direction. First, let's be clear. Zionism is simply the idea that Jewish people have the right to national self-determination. Anti-Zionism, then, is not criticism of Israel. It is the idea that Israel should cease to exist. Second, to dismiss anti-Semitism's role in the dialogue around Israel is to imply that ideas about Jewish people have little or no impact on our ideas about the Jewish state. That is simply an unsustainable idea. Third, people of goodwill, when confronted with the possibility that we harbor prejudice, do not reject the idea out of hand. We engage in self-reflection, and that's rarely happening here. But we cannot see inside people's heads, so we cannot prove or disprove racist motivations. To find an accommodation around this problem, we have two recommendations. They may seem simplistic, but we think they would be two important first steps. Number one, be pro-Palestinian. When activists reserve all their resources for attacking Israel, but do not substantively advance the well-being of Palestinians, it is understandable that we might question their sincerity. If overseas Palestinian activists seemed genuinely concerned with Palestinian people, their lives, their liberties, and the equality of Palestinian women and minorities, the term pro-Palestinian would be fitting, and it would be far more difficult to accuse them of anti-Semitism. Number two, be pro-Israel. Yes, this will be a jagged pill for some activists, but violence will never free Palestine. Peace and Palestinian self-determination will come only through a negotiated agreement in which neither side gets everything they want. If we are demonizing one side or the other, if we reward intransigence, intolerance, and extremism, if we do anything other than encourage both peoples to live in peace, we do not deserve to call ourselves pro-Israel or pro-Palestinian. Finally, the last section of this toolkit offers a range of steps for people to confront anti-Semitism. Each of these individually is a small gesture, but each of us can change the world by improving our corner of it. Please, after this event, go online, take some time with the toolkit. A millennia old problem will not be resolved in a day, but we do hope this toolkit will provide information and inspiration that will move us in the right direction. Be an upstander is not the last word on this subject, far from it. We view this as a work in progress. 
This resource stands on the shoulders of excellent work done previously by a vast number of individuals and organizations. But we also hope that fresh perspectives from all of you will allow us to crowdsource more ideas to make this resource even more effective. Thank you again to everyone who made this toolkit and this event possible, especially you who have joined us to learn more. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. All right, guys, thank you so much, Pat, for that. Listen, I have written toolkits before. This one blew me away. You guys, honestly, I have to say, hats off to you. As somebody who is in the Jewish community, uh, speaking to people who are outside of the Jewish community, this toolkit hits every single topic on its head. And I have to say, you should be very proud of it. And I wanted to say that before I said anything else. It was Phenomenal, phenomenal. Uh, so guys, you're, you're very, thank you. Um, so guys, uh, that is, uh, you know, this is the time we have now for questions and answers. And I know that you guys have been raising your hands throughout the entire thing and you have your questions that you wanted to ask. So Pat and I are here to answer uh, your, your questions. Uh, before we do that, I wanted to thank Pat again for the overview. I urge everyone to download the toolkit after this is over and share it with your networks. This is something that is absolutely a necessity for fighting anti-Semitism. Thank you again to Special Envoy Deborah Lyons, Rabbi uh, Lynn uh, Greeno, and Zara Naibo. We have all been given a great deal to think about today. And I know that your questions uh, need to be answered now. So let's get right into it. Let's get into some of the questions. Uh, Pat, you have them there in front of you. I have them there in front of me. You want to go one-on-one? -on -one? Uh, why don't you start? Because I actually have not had a chance to uh, sort of survey them. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. <laughs> so let me get into the first one then here. Oh, I see. The okay. First... okay, go ahead, Jack. You got them? All right. So the first one says, why do you think more people are not standing up to anti-Semitism? And as, a, you know, I, I'd love to hear your answer as somebody from outside of the Jewish community, and I'll give my answer as somebody from inside of the Jewish community. You know, for me, when I moved to Canada in 2011, I came from, when I lived in Canada as a younger person, I lived in a very uh, tight Jewish bubble. I then went back to Israel for 23 years, came back to Canada, and then after all these years of being in such a Jewish bubble, it was very odd for me to find myself in a situation where all of a sudden now I am not the majority, I am the minority, and all of a sudden now I am fighting this hatred that I never really had to deal with before. So why do I think people are not standing up to anti-Semitism? If I have to look at it historically and speak, you know, through the voice of my grandfather, I will say that anti-Semitism is the oldest racism in the world. It is the oldest racism on the books. It is something that is generational. It is something that morphs. It is something that, uh, you know, depending on what the ill of the world is at that time and, you know, in history, anti-Semitism will take that on. So the ills of Canada, whatever they are, the Jews are responsible. The ills of the Middle East, what's happening right now, the Jews are responsible. That is why I think that not enough people fight against anti-Semitism because I don't think they know how to define it. And that is why I think the IRA definition of anti-Semitism is so very important. What do you think? Uh, I agree with all your all your points. And one of the key uh, aspects of this uh, toolkit is, as I said, it's not an easy read. And that is because we've included some very, very explicit examples of how anti-Semitism manifests. And so, you know, you can use the IRA definition um, uh, mm -hmm. and... That is, uh, that is one tool, but the examples are important too here because um, to be able to combat this, we need to understand what it looks like. And that is one of the core purposes of this toolkit. Um, on the bigger question of why more people are not, uh, are not standing up against anti-Semitism, um, I would add two things to what you mentioned. Uh, yep. one, of, one of them I sort of made reference to, and that is 
that we are in a time when the race dialogue uh, views prejudice as the combination of power and privilege mm -hmm. um, and anti-Semitism by very definition assigns those characteristics to Jews. So it is a reflexive form of racism that uh, is self-supporting. Um, the, the idea, the, if, if we accept even subconsciously or even a little bit that Jews as a group are powerful, um, we would not be motivated <laughs> to, um, to stand with them. Um, and so I think that is a fundamental problem here is um, a lot of people, again, this is a subconscious inherent bias uh, about Jewish power. Um, and, um, and I think uh, that does not motivate people to stand up. The other thing, and, and uh, you mentioned this at the outset, the other very important thing is that we need to recognize this is a problem in Canada. We cannot assume that when the conflict over there settles down, things will settle down over here. That's not good enough. That is not addressing the problem. Right. So we cannot view anti-Semitism in Canada as a consequence of overseas events. So those two, those two factors, in addition to what you mentioned, I think are key. And, and I absolutely agree with everything you said. The next question I'm actually going to pose to you, because it is, what is the one thing that you would like most people to take away from this webinar or from the toolkit specifically, if you have to pick one thing? <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, think, you're going to pick one. Yeah, uh, I think it is that, um, that anti-Semitism may not look like what you think it looks like. So in Vancouver, I'm in Vancouver. Um, Recently, we had a, um, an arson attack on a synagogue here. Um, everybody, all people of goodwill, um, recognize that for what it is. It is an act of overt, hateful anti-Semitism, and we all condemn that. Um, where we need to work is recognizing in ourselves, in our circles, and in our society, that there are biases that we may not even know we carry or that we are only vaguely aware of. And those are the things that we need to address in ourselves and our society. That to me is, if, if people take one thing away from this, um, that is it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that's an important one. Um, the next question comes in and it says, why do you refer to anti-Semitism as racism when Jews aren't a race? And I think that this is one of those questions that I get thrown at constantly. It doesn't matter what school I'm at, what university I'm at. I'm already asked that same question. And I answer the question always the same way. I mean, it's kind of a double-edged sword. First of all, I think the term racism has a broader definition, certainly today, than what it was maybe when it was first uh, you know, defined. Racism today refers to not only racism against racism, uh, it can be racism against ethnicities, it can be racism against uh, certain minority groups. Uh, you know, certainly we hear today, we, we hear it all the time, anti-Palestinian racism. Palestinians a nationality, and yet we are attributing racism to being anti-Palestinian. So, of course, it changes, it morphs, it, 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 it changes its way in which it's, it's defined. Now, I think that in North America, certainly for me, um, you know, I've been speaking on North American campuses since 2014 now, and I can tell you that the American racial construct is so, we are so stuck here in Canada and in the U.S., in the American racial construct, that we cannot see past what that is. And the American racial construct, as opposed to the Canadian racial construct, is very different because of the one thing that, you know, Americans, you know, deal with in their history on the daily, which is slavery and the anti-Black racism that still exists very, you know, to, to its core in the U.S. I think that Jews have, I don't think, I know, Jews have existed long before the American racial construct and will exist long after. Hopefully the American racial construct, uh, you know, uh, falls apart because it's one of the most racist, if not the most racist racial construct in the world. My hope is, is that people understand that you cannot put Jews who are a multi-ethnic, multi-racial um, people in one category and say, this is a race of people. 
it's it's a, it's it's an old way of looking at a definition, and I think we need to modernize it. And I think we definitely to need to modernize it and disassociate ourselves, or at least here in Canada, try to take ourselves out of what is the American racial construct, because that seems to be the racial construct that is really dictating for much of the world the way that we look at and view race. What do you think? Um, I, I think you're right. Um, we address this very, very specifically in the document because one of the core problems that we face is that people, and, and this sounds, um, this may sound ridiculous, but people don't know what a Jew is. Um, I have had people say, the Jewish people do not deserve national self-determination because they are a religion. And this is a this is an incomplete understanding of Jewish identity. And we go into right. this in in detail in the document to explain the uh, the nature of Jewishness. Um, Judaism is a religion. Jewishness is something broader with the Jewish religion, uh, Judaism at its core. Um, the bottom line is that anti-Semitism racializes Jews. In many cases, it racializes Jews incorrectly as white, in okay. which is not the case for many or most uh, Jews in Israel, and certainly not those uh, few that remain across the Middle East and North Africa. But uh, but it <laughs> racializes Jewish people, and if for no other reason, that is justification for using the term uh, anti-Jewish racism. Mm -hmm. I, and, and I agree with you. And I think that it's really important for just on a very, you know, kind of like we say in Hebrew, like I'm standing on one foot and I quickly have to explain something. Jews are what's called an ethno-religious group. We are also an ethnic group. We are also a religious group. I can be atheist, but I am still a Jew. When I do my DNA, it does not know my religion, yet it does know my ethnicity. So, you know, one of those things that people don't understand is that multifacet that you just explained. And I, I appreciate uh, uh, you bringing that up because I think that that's really important. Okay, one of the next questions we have here is, can you give us some specific examples of steps we can take to confront anti-Semitism at work slash social settings in society or online? Oh, I have many, but I'm going to let you start with this. Yeah. So that's what this is all about. Um, yeah. Uh, I will. I, I'm going to be, I, I, I am actually, uh, if I started, I wouldn't stop. But there, <laughs> the, the entire third section of this document is very specific and, again, probably 15 or 20 minutes, please download it. Um, there are very specific examples of things that you can do, including, including, and um, there is a, a document that we're creating called In Your Back Pocket, which, um, which are um, phrases and approaches that you should sort of have in your back pocket when a situation occurs because what happens a lot of times when we are confronted with a racist or other inappropriate comment is we are so shocked we don't respond appropriately in the moment and as in everything else preparation is key and so if you have sort of taken a moment to review certain ways that are best practices in responding to situations like this um that uh that sort of um kernel will be back in your brain when you when you need it and you can pull it out um that's one at work um this is a particular challenge and we're hearing this uh from a great number of people jewish people in particular obviously in in particular are um experiencing things in the workplace right now that human resources departments in many cases mm -hmm. seem incapable of dealing with and again it often comes down to the fact that, um, you know, you, you've uh, made a differentiation between the American and the Canadian construct. Uh, there is that, but there's also the fundamental reality that anti-Semitic, because Jewish people don't fit in the boxes that we like to place people, as, as we were just talking about, anti-Semitism differs from other forms of racism. And right. even well-intentioned people, often in the human resources department, um, do not know and have not been trained how to deal with this particular form of, and I'll use the term again, racism. Um, mm -hmm. And so that that is a very significant problem. And there are great organizations in Canada who are doing training specifically 
to human resources, um, to corporations and organizations doing this training. Um, and accompanying this toolkit is a um, extensive list of resources. They're on our website, uh, but they link from the document as well. Um, that uh, you can access um, many of the resources that are available in Canada. And, um, and those are things, including organizations you can reach out to for help. Amazing. Okay, and we have three more minutes, guys. So I'm going to get to, we're going to do two more questions. I apologize. That, and there are so many great questions here, guys, but I'm going to get two more. Uh, one of them says, how do you initiate a conversation when you meet someone yelling free Palestine? So I'm going to start off with this one and just say, listen, if someone is yelling free Palestine, I want to know more. I want to know more about, I mean, that in and of itself is a slogan. What do you mean by free Palestine? Let's talk about it. And if you're willing to sit down and you're willing to talk to me about it, and you're willing to say, well, what this means to me is A, B, C, D, E, then we can have a conversation. And already we've started off, we're, we're, we're on a good foot. If all you're there to do is yell free Palestine and then not talk to me and then not engage with me and then not have to hear anything that I have to say, well, then you're just being disingenuous. And then you are just simply using, you know, buzzwords that you've heard on school or that are, you know, popular now. And you're trying to be part of a group, which you're not really understanding the nuance and really the history of the of, of what we're talking about here. So just if someone's just yelling at me free Palestine, let's talk about it. I am the first person who will sit down and talk to somebody about it. If you are going to just yell it at me and pass by and not hear what I have to say, well, then what I would say to those people is you have to be able to know your audience. There are going to be the people who are willing to listen to what you have to say and willing to have a discussion. And there are going to be those people who are not willing. And then there are those people who are on the middle, the 50-50. Those are the people you want to engage with. Those are the people who have not yet made up their mind where they are. And I think those are the people that you're going to have the best success with when it comes to free Palestine or, or you know, any of the other buzzwords that we hear. What do, what do you think? Well, it's funny because, and you are, um, uh, <laughs> maybe you're friendlier than I am, but. Um, <laughs> the, um, you know that that's not true. The, 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 the question was, if somebody's yelling at you, Free Palestine. Um, if okay. somebody's yelling at you, I'm not sure that this is a place to start anyway. But um, one of the very specific uh, things that is, are mentioned in the um, in the steps in the third section of this yep. uh, document is um, adopt the 80-20 rule. So if you're going to engage with people on this subject, um, devote 80% of your time and resources to those who have a legitimate or, or appear to have a legitimate likelihood of listening to you and perhaps having an open mind that will, um, will take what you say seriously. Um, and if you're going to argue online or in real time or with family over dinner, you know, leave, leave it to 20% of your time. There's there's a lot to be done and uh, let's not waste our resources. That's kind of my, um, that's kind of my uh, position. But but you're right, Shai, that there's, there's a, a small group on either side who are very entrenched in their positions. Uh, the vast proportion of Canadians are not married to any position on these things. And they are open to discussion and um and this toolkit is intended to equip people to have those discussions that's amazing and then i'm going to end with this question guys and then I, again i want to thank everybody for joining us uh really um what is the uh dissemination plan for the toolkit oh so we have um a lot of the people who have joined us on this um on this webinar uh, represent a wide range of Canadian civil society. Uh, okay. A lot of folks, obviously, uh, you know, weren't available at this time on a Sunday afternoon. Um, <laughs> and so we will be uh, we will be distributing both this uh, a video. Everybody who's on here, as you said, will receive uh, the video of this uh, that they can share if they would like. We would love it if you shared this, uh, as well as the toolkit itself. Um, and we will be disseminating that throughout. Uh, organizations and uh, you know appropriate online uh, you know social media and so forth um, reaching 
anti-racist organizations, multicultural communities, um, uh, nonprofit organizations, and uh, people across Canada who uh, can use and share this resource. So, um, so our idea is to get it into as many hands as possible. And uh, today is a great start. We're thrilled with the um, several hundred people who have signed up. Um, and I just want to take a second to, again, thank everybody so much for joining us today. It just really is a, um, a reassurance and, and um, a, a spirit of hope that you joined us today. And I, I just want to uh, echo and uh, mirror that exactly what you said. Thank you so much to all of you who joined us today. Really, you being here is already solving the problem. It is taking that first step and this toolkit, please share with your families, your friends, your social groups, uh, you know, don't be that party pooper, but take it to the parties and say, listen, guys, I have something cool we can talk about because there is something in there for everybody. So thank you again, Pat. Thank you again to everybody who participated. It was my honor to be a host. Thank you, Shai. Thank you, everybody.